Hi, Melissa. Thank you for joining us for Women's Box in Wales, Past, Present and Future. We're delighted to hear from you today about your experience of the history of women's boxing and some of the key moments that you, you want to pick out for us. Sure. It's wonderful to meet you and, uh, and be able to participate in this very exciting project that promotes women's boxing. Thank you. Um, so over to you whenever you're ready. Sure. Well, why don't we start at the beginning, or at least the beginning that we know of uh, in terms of boxing itself. Um, in the early 1700s, a man by the name of James Figg developed what we think of as the boxing style that we are are very, very familiar with. It's a bare knuckle boxing style. And it came out of prize fighting where men would, would hold on to a cudgel, which was about this big, and fight each other. And then they started to use their fist as well as the cudgel. And then the idea of it came that you would hold like a 20 gold sovereign piece in your hand and whoever dropped it first would lose the fight. So uh, as I said, that kind of became popular in the early 1700s on the fairgrounds. And sometime 1720, 1721, 1722, women began to participate and fight as well. Uh, most famously, there was a fighter named Elizabeth Wilkinson Stokes, who, uh, known as the city champion, uh, championess, and Hannah Hayfield, she was the Newgate market basket woman. Um, and they had their first fight, as I said, sometime in 1722. It was uh, publicized in the manner of the day, which is, you know, much as boxing is today, there was promotion before a fight. And each woman took out an ad in the London Journal paper in this 1722, calling each other out for the fight. Uh, again, where they would hold a gold sovereign and whoever dropped it first would lose the fight. By 1723, the London Journal was publishing a little piece saying that, you know, Barely a week passes when you don't see a boxing match between women at the beer garden but, uh, or at Hockley in the Hole. There were several other venues that became quite popular. Uh, and there were other types of fighting that would occur, mostly men's prize fighting, which in some cases were purely bare knuckle boxing and some were still cudgels. And this went on for some time, you know, and became popular um, through the 18th century as a manly, gentlemanly sport. And um, by the end of the century, there were these very strict rules in place and famous bare knuckle boxing champions. Women continued to fight as well, although were much less visible by the late Eight, uh, 1700s, although there was one famous publicized fight between a woman whose name we don't know other than the Jewess of Wentworth Street, who fought a fight in 1795 against a woman named Marianne Fiedling, and the, J the Jewish boxing champion Daniel Mendoza served as her second. So it was quite, quite uh, an event in London at that time. Uh, by the early 1800s, um, as there were a series of scandals, sort of the end of the Regency era and into the Victorian era in, in the United Kingdom, uh, boxing was and was not legal in different jurisdictions. And if it became illegal in one place, then people would all trounce to a field somewhere else and have boxing. And again, women would still participate, but there was much more hue and cry against it and against boxing itself because it was had become quite corrupt with um, the kinds of scandals we see today <laughs> fight fixing all and even though there were royal patronages of some of these boxing schools and some of the fighters they were still lots of problems so and by the time the victorians came in boxing essentially died in the united kingdom and it switched over to the united states for women with occasional little battles that you would one can find traces of in in newspaper accounts boxing really didn't start till the 18 the late 1870s in new york city um, there was a man named harry hill who was actually had come from london 
And he started a variety theater, or basically a bar, which he called a variety theater, in the Bowery. And he had various types of dancing acts and other kinds of things. But he also had um, some interest in boxing and used to have boxing matches in the back of his theater. In the Sometime in the 1870s, he said, why not have, try women? That would be fun. And so we had a famous fight with two women, and the winner would win a silver dish, a silver butter dish. It was publicized in all the local papers, even made it to syndication around the world, this famous women's bout. And the two women acquitted themselves very well, and it became enormously popular. And by the, fo- by the following month, he was having w- weekly shows, and then he started to have daily shows, and he had shows where they had women starting to come from all over the United States to participate in these spouts because they were, as I said, enormously popular, and then they started to come on the road and got into the sort of the variety theater circuit, and you could find women doing these boxing shows as far afield as Chicago, San Francisco, um, down into the South. So it was quite remarkable. And by 1887, a woman named Hattie Stewart, also known as the female John L. Sullivan, who was the most famous heavyweight bare bare knuckle boxer of the day in the United States. She, uh, became featured on a series of trading cards by the W.S. Kimball and Company, cigarette company, and was listed as the champion female boxer of the world. So it was quite an accomplishment in this 10-year arc from the late 1870s when no one ever considered that two women would be involved in fisticuffs on a stage to the point where she's actually on a trading card. I will add, the only other woman on this trading cards was the trick shooter, Annie Oakley. So it gives you a sense of of what her popularity must have been in that era. Um, It also began to appear on the variety theater stage in the United Kingdom and in, in Britain. And by 1900, Polly Fairclough, um, also know, late, known later in night, life as Polly Fairclough Burns, began to perform boxing on the th- stage as well with her husband. She had married into a very fam- famous old boxing family, the Fairclouds of Liverpool, who used to put on boxing shows at fairgrounds, it's basically tent, what are called tent shows, where folks would invite in the crowd to watch a boxing match, or two or three, and then would invite members of the audience up onto the, onto the boxing ring. And if they won, you know, they'd get like 25 pounds or some ridiculous amount of money, which, of course, they very, very rarely had any member of the crowd win. And Polly began to appear in these shows as well. And there was, are actually some existing photos from the early 1900s showing this rather stout woman all ready to fight. So um, again, it became a global phenomenon. It became so popular that by 1904, when men had been invited to uh, participate in the Olympics as an exhibition for boxing, women were also invited to have one fight as part of the larger background St. Louis exhibition to show off boxing. And there is an existing photo that shows two women decked out in very, very large bloomers with gloves on going at it. So um, that is the level of popularity where the sport had been. And again, you know, there were continuing to be variety theater shows in the United Kingdom, variety theater shows in in the United States, um, and some real boxing bouts where... Um, Women would, uh, even though it was legal in the sense of the amateur, official amateur world of sports, they would still have smokers and women would contest. Um, There was a famous woman in the United States known as Texas Mamie, and she had quite some popularity in the early uh, 1900s. Um, So it was quite quite an extraordinary experience. 
Women's boxing, however, never really gained acceptance, except in strange circumstance. During World War I, um, and this was unique to the United Kingdom, as the men went off to fight in World War I, there was a dearth of fighters. And in Liverpool, which was a big seat of boxing, there were advertisements for women to box and encouraging the audience to come as a patriotic duty because the women were standing in for the men in the boxing ring. So, uh, you know, the notion of, of boxing as this hyper-masculine sport could be mutable in under certain circumstances. And mostly, you know, the, the, the hue and cry against women participating was that it wasn't ladylike, it wasn't feminine, it was a masculine sport, how to have their try. And you notice that this is all in the background of the suffragette movement. So there's this real impetus for women to step into the world of politics, the right being given the right to vote, the right to have self-determination. And so if you think of boxing in this background as this small little niche that is part of this larger movement for women, um, it's, it actually plays out in very interesting ways because they are able to accomplish these boxing shows and even had all female lineups on variety theater stage. Uh, there's a fighter named Vera Rome. There was a fighter from England, fighters from England, fighters from France who appeared on the British variety theater stage right in this period of World War One.